Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Joshua Gonzalez, and I am the Assistant Cultural Affairs Officer here at the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo. In collaboration with World Learning, we are excited to bring you a great virtual program today. The topic for today's program is Strengthening Supply Chain Resilience, U.S.-Japan Relations. I'm honored to be joined by our speaker today, Mr. Matthew P. Goodman, who is Senior Vice President for Economics at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I'm also pleased to be joined today by the moderator for today's event, Professor Kazuo Suzuki. Before we begin, I have to go over a few administrative items. Uh, first, this session is on the record and it is being recorded. I would also like to let our audience know that the speaker and moderator are not employees of the US government, uh, so their remarks and their opinions do not express do not represent the official policy of the US government. Today's program uh, for today's program, we are providing simultaneous English and Japanese interpretation. If you look at the bottom of your screen, there is a uh, a globe where it says interpretation, please select the language you would like to use uh, for today's program. Captioning for today's program is also being provided. Uh, it's available in your web browser, and we have put some instructions in the chat box. Following today's discussion between our speaker and our moderator, we will open up the session for questions and answers. We invite you to submit your questions throughout the session uh, via the Q&A box, which is in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. You can submit questions anonymously, and you may also submit questions in either English or Japanese. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker and our moderator for today's program. Mr. Matthew P. Goodman is Senior Vice President for Economics and holds the Simon Chair in Political Economy at CSIS. Goodman is a highly accomplished economist and influential figure in international economic policy. Before joining CSIS in 2012, Goodman served as Director for International Economics at the National Security Council staff, helping the President prepare for global and regional summits, including the G20, Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, and the East Asia Summit. Prior to the White House, Goodman was Senior Advisor to the Undersecretary for Economic Affairs at the U.S. Department of State from 1988 to 1997. He worked as an international economist at the U.S. Treasury Department, including five years as financial attache right here at the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo. Goodman also holds an MA in International Relations from the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and a BSc in Economics from the London School of Economics and Political Science. The moderator for today's program is Professor Kazuo Suzuki. He is Professor of Science and Technology Policy at the Graduate School of Public Policy at the University of Tokyo and Director of the Institute of Geoeconomics an independent think tank. He graduated from the Department of International Relations, Ritsu Meikang University, and received his PhD from Sussex European Institute, University of Sussex. He worked as associate professor at the University of Tsukuba from 2000 to 2008. He served as professor of international politics at Hokkaido University until 2020. From 2013 to 2015, he served as an expert on the panel of experts for the Iranian Sanctions Committee of the United Nations Security Council. He currently serves as president of the Japan Association of International Security and Trade. So with that, I would like to pass it over to our moderator, Professor Suzuki. Well, thank you very much, uh, Joshua, and uh, thank you very much for uh, everyone to come. Uh, my name is Kazuto Suzuki, um, as introduced, and I am very honored to be a moderator here today and talking with uh, uh, Dr. Masha Goodman. So, um, Matthew, um, <clears throat> it's very nice to see you again. <laughs> we meet uh, quite often. Um, so, uh, today's subject is the supply chain resilience and um, this is the very 
important and also very widely discussed uh, subject. But in my understanding, the concept of uh, economic security or the supply chain resi resilience uh, varies country to country. Uh, for example, Japan and US, although it, uh, both countries have a very close consultations, but still, I I'm not sure that we are on the same page or we are on the same definition. So how do you uh, define economic security and supply chain resilience? Well, thank you for that very good question, Suzuki Sensei, and it's good to be here uh, with you and our friends in Tokyo. So good morning, everyone. Um, very good question. And I agree with uh, the question's premise, that is that there are different definitions and different understandings of this important concept of economic security. Um, I, Japan actually used the term first uh, there, the, the term is now embedded in Japanese law. You have a law on economic security. Um, in the United States, we do not have such a formal definition of economic security, and we've only, we have only been using it um, as a common term relatively recently. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there are differences of interpretation. I think we, we all basically understand that it means ensuring that our, um, our economies are um, protected against threats and risks that could disrupt economic activity um, and that uh, could ultimately undermine our national security um, directly or indirectly. And so I think broadly there's a shared understanding about this and a concern about uh, strengthening economic security in both the U.S. and Japan, but there are some nuances of difference about exactly what uh, government policies or indeed private sector um, actions fall under this term, and uh, and I think that that to some extent may be uh, appropriate since we have different challenges. Uh, in, in each country, but I do think it's important for both sides to try to come to uh, a, a closer uh, common understanding. And let me just say one more thing, which is the, the G7, the Group of Seven uh, Summit of uh, Leaders that was held in Hiroshima just uh, a month or so ago, uh, chaired by uh, Prime Minister Kishida uh, in Japan's host year, uh, did uh, use this term economic security and indeed had a separate statement on economic security and economic resilience uh, that helped to define the term. And supply chain resilience was the first item mentioned as a central part of economic security. So I think it's a, an appropriate topic for us to talk about today. Right. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think, yes. Uh, from a Japanese point of view, as you said, uh, Japan is embedded the secure, economic security as a part of the law called the Economic Security Promotion Act, or ESPA. And this ESPA is defined that to reduce the risks and, uh, and meet the challenges and then ensure the security of the supply chain. Uh, but I think it is primarily aiming at uh, avoiding the disruption of the supply chain by the intentional or some sort of a political uh, with the, you know the disruption uh, occurred by the uh, certain with the certain uh, political objectives. So I think uh, there are sort of a, uh, differences between the United States and Japan with regard to the you know how much you take the uh, unintentional causes such as uh, COVID-19 or uh, or a natural disaster. And I think th there is a, a sort of a different nuances, as you said, uh, between Japan and US. But I think, uh, as you said, the G7 summit, as well as uh, in the various documents that we are going to discuss today, uh, Japan and United States are uh, 
uh, sort of approaching each other, um, despite the, there is a slight difference in nuances, I think there is a general uh, common understanding between our countries about you know how to reduce the risks, and we are facing uh, sort of a similar challenges. So, my next question is that uh, in this context, Japan and uh, United States has agreed the U.S.-Japan supply chain agreement. Uh, which focuses on the semiconductor and the rare earth minerals. And could you explain why semiconductor and the rare earth minerals, these two uh, items are important? And how do you see the effectiveness of the uh, uh, disagreement? Well, um, there have been a number of initiatives uh, between the US and Japan and with other allied partners, including in the G7 um, and beyond covering several of these uh, specific aspects of supply chains. So you've mentioned semiconductors, which are the most important ingredient in every economic um, system and every economic, uh, every machine we use, including the one we're using now. Mm -hmm. uh, semiconductors are at the center of that. So it's an absolutely critical part of today's global economy. Um, obviously, it's central to artificial intelligence and um, also to military um, uses and so forth. So it's a critical uh, thing. And that's one specific area of focus for supply chain um, resilience. Uh, then there's the area of critical minerals. And critical minerals really um, include a number of, of different um, minerals on the on the um, on the uh, mineral table or the chart of, <laughs> of, um, of minerals, uh, there are these rare earth uh, minerals that are not that rare, but are available widely around the world, but they're quite difficult to extract and to convert into useful purposes like um, using in magnets and um, certain um, uh, light, lighting and military um, applications as well. So that's one thing. And then there's a number of other uh, critical minerals like lithium, um, uh, cobalt, uh, nickel, and, and some others that are critical ingredients in some of the new uh, technologies that uh, both the United States and Japan are trying to develop like uh, batteries electric vehicle batteries, um, which include a lot of these minerals. Um, uh, and so, so there's a range of different issues that the US and Japan have been working together to try to ensure greater uh, supply chain resilience. And you know, at the heart of this is a, a, a basic problem, which is that uh, while these minerals um, and these semiconductors are, are, are either found or or produced um, in in many parts of the world, uh, they are their the production in, in both cases is very concentrated in certain places. So semiconductors, uh, especially advanced semiconductors, are very heavily concentrated in Taiwan. Um, something like ninety percent of advanced semiconductors. Um, of course, other countries contribute: Japan, Korea, um, and then China produces less uh, high end. Uh, high value semiconductors. So there's a concentration problem there. And then on minerals, although the minerals come from all over the world, uh, there's a high percentage of those minerals that are processed, you know, taken from the earth and turned into some useful um, processed uh, item that goes into a battery or some other ultimate product. And a, a high percentage of the, a lot of those critical minerals um, are produced in China. And given our concerns about over-dependence on this country, which the United States and Japan have essentially declared a strategic competitor, a com country that we are competing with in a strategic sense, uh, as well as an economic uh, sense, uh, there is a desire to try to reduce those dependencies on China as a source of processed minerals. And, mm -hmm. and frankly, it's a slightly different problem, but I mean, same source of the problem, uh, uh, you know, an effort to reduce over-dependence on uh, some countries for production of semiconductors. So these agreements are in, in between the United States and Japan and with other partners are essentially trying to get to those 
uh, problems and find a way of producing more diversified or, yeah. or widespread uh, sources of supply from different countries, not only from one or two countries. Mm -hmm. So that's what the essence of these agreements is. All right. Well, thank you. Um, I, I think it is uh, crucial to understand that if we depend heavily on one item on the one country, then there is always a risk. Um, if there is a natural disaster or even, you know, uh, these uh, countries or regions going to uh, some sort of a military conflict, then the supply will be disrupted and then it won't, uh, you know, we won't be able to, to gain access to the very important uh, components such as uh, um, semiconductor or important minerals. Uh, so I think it is extremely important to have a diversification and to diversify the supply chain is the critical importance. And I think Japan and the United States are on the same term to try and find the different, uh, you know, uh, different points of supplies so that uh, we will not be over dependent on one country or one uh, region for the for such uh, critical supply. And uh, semiconductor, of course, as you said, is is important for all the electronic appliances and devices, but it is also having a very important military implications. So if we have a problem of the supply chain, then we would face the significant uh, problem for the uh, uh, development of our uh, military capabilities. Um, so as um, um, you know, the critical minerals are quite important for the emerging industries such as uh, electric vehicles. So I think it is, uh, it is quite important. So thank There's you. One, can uh, I for, yeah. Sure, Sorry, sure, sure. didn't mean to interrupt. Well, go, go ahead, go ahead. wanted to add one other um, uh, sort of practical point that lies uh, uh, beneath this U.S.-Japan agreement on critical mm -hmm. minerals, which is that the United States last year uh, passed a law which um, incentivized or created incentives for um, companies to produce electric vehicles in the United States. It's called the Inflation Reduction Act, or IRA, which is a little bit of a misleading title, uh, but, <laughs> but it's basically about trying to promote uh, development of clean energy uh, technologies, including electric vehicle technologies in the United States, and created subsidies and other incentives for uh, companies, US companies, and also Japanese companies and companies from other countries to invest in the United States um, in these capabilities. And uh, there is in that law a requirement that a certain percentage of the batteries that go into electric vehicle, a certain percentage of the, of the um, minerals that go into those batteries have to be produced in the United States or in a country that the United States has a free trade agreement with. And this is why the U.S. Uh, decided to negotiate this agreement with Japan and why Japan was interested in mm -hmm. negotiating this agreement, uh, because it enabled uh, this uh, provision of a free trade agreement to be um, enacted to enable uh, minerals processed in Japan to be counted towards that, uh, that required level. Um, we're also the U.S. is negotiating similar agreements with the European Union, uh, with the United Kingdom, with India now, and uh, so we're trying to broaden this spectrum. It's a controversial thing in both places in Japan because it's seen as a little bit of a protectionist measure to protect U.S. Uh, markets and business and and production and jobs. Uh, it's controversial in the United States uh, these uh, these agreements because. Uh, because uh, they are uh, not approved by the United States Congress, and therefore um, are there are many people in Congress now who are complaining that the Biden administration negotiated this agreement without uh, a proper consultation or approval uh, from con Congress, which is required, they say, under the U.S. Constitution. So, right. um, so it's a controversial um, background to these agreements, but but that's the broader story beyond just the the, the pure issue of supply chain resilience. Right. 
Well, oh, um, of course, um, just to um, add to what you said, I think this is a question of onshoring or reshoring that trying to bring back the production in 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 United States or in your country. And that is in, in, inevitably, um, you know, um, create some sort of a situation where, you know, this is a, a more protectionist trade because you are you are requiring the some sort of a production of the of the of the goods in your country, which means that you are denying the free trade. Um, so I think the uh, the provision that it includes the United States allow the um, countries the production or product products coming from the countries with the free trade agreement is important because it opens up the the um, it opens up the country or it opens up the market but at the same time as you said uh, in Congress there is a very stronger trend that the supply chain should be remain in United States and that is from our point of view, from a Japanese point of view, it's uh, it's more like a protectionist measure. So I think the balance between the security of supply chain and the uh, the free trade is always a very difficult balances that you need to take. And I think this is a this is a good example of that. Absolutely, yes, I agree. Right. So the ne next question is uh, similar to that uh, critical mineral is about the semiconductor. The United States has um, has decided to uh, to strengthen the control over the uh, export of the semiconductor, uh, including the design and software and the equipment to make these uh, high end or the advanced uh, semiconductor. Uh, to China. So what do you see the implication of this for the strengthening the uh, resilience of supply chain? Uh... Yes, well, I think this is a very um, related but slightly different issue from the broader um, issues that we're discussing about supply chain resilience. I think um, the Biden administration, as you mentioned, on October 7th last year, uh, implemented these uh, very extensive controls on the export of uh, certain advanced uh, semiconductors and uh, the machinery and equipment to make those semiconductors. Uh, th they uh, put controls on the export of those things to China, quite strict. And in, 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 in explaining uh, this, the White House said that this was um, a, a targeted effort uh, by the U.S. government to deny China the ability to access those high-level semiconductors, which could be used in military applications like um, artificial intelligence that enhances um, uh, drones or, or um, other um, battlefield um, um, uh, weapons. Um, and that it was aimed to deny China the access to those semiconductors and to the ability to make those semiconductors. Um, and it was very clearly stated as a national security priority um, and, and, a, and a limited targeted um, effort to go after that particular part of the semiconductor market. Um, it was described as a uh, a small yard with a tall fence, so a, a small garden and a very tall fence to protect just that area. The rest of the garden is supposed to be open, uh, but this part is, is um, you know, it's a very clear effort to try to d deny uh, China that capability. Um, and, uh, and the problem for the United States is that we are not the only player, the only country that is involved in this story because Japan has a couple of companies, great companies that produce some of the best equipment to help make those advanced semiconductors. Um, the Netherlands also has one company uh, in particular that is uh, the, the leading company in producing a certain type of machinery used to make these advanced semiconductors. And so if the US took this action alone, as it did on October 7th, there was a risk that 
uh, China would still be able to get these semiconductors or the equipment to make them from other countries, from Japan or the Netherlands or countries that buy these machines from Japan or the Netherlands. So the US had to get Japan and the Netherlands to agree to take similar uh, controls, to impl impose similar controls on this, this, uh, this machinery. And that was a difficult negotiation uh, behind closed doors behind the screen, um, but between the U.S. and Japanese government and the U.S. and Netherlands governments, and both governments have now imposed similar controls uh, to the U.S. Uh, actions. But um, so it was a kind of risky strategy by the U.S., and it required help uh, from, in this case, from Japan and the Netherlands. This is a common feature of sanctions and export controls that they are more effective when you multilateralize them, or that is get many countries to impose the same controls or same sanctions. If only one country does it, then there's a lot of opportunity for um, evasion or, or avoidance of the sanctions and an ability for uh, these sensitive products to get to uh, the, the country that is of concern, in this case, China. Right. Well, uh, thank you. I, I think it is uh, also important to to remember that China Chinese capability of developing the uh, semiconductor is growing very fast, and they are investing a lot in the semiconductor issues. So, um, so if there is no um, uh, support from Netherlands or Japan to uh, to restrict the export to China, then, you know, they may use those equipments to build up the high-end chips, which is intended to be blocked by the US export control. So I think the cooperation of China, uh, of Japan and the Netherlands is extremely important. And from Japanese point of view, uh, we do have this, uh, this we, we agreed that this is an important issue for the security matters. You know, Japan and the United States face the ch same challenges from China, and the Chinese ec military um, development uh, is uh, 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 quite substantial. And uh, we are facing the, you know, we are much closer to China, and we do have a territorial dispute. We do uh, face these uh, challenges almost every day. So I think it is uh, important for Japan to enhance the, you know, uh, security to, to prevent or to slow down Chinese uh, military buildup uh, for uh, by um, restricting the, the export control. However, so having said that, I, I think, you know, as you said, the semiconductor global supply chain is more wider than Netherlands or Japan. Japan and Netherlands are the producer of the um, uh, 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 semiconductor uh, manufacturing equipments, but also there are countries like Taiwan or South Korea, which are producing a very strong, uh, you know, very high-end, uh, sophisticated uh, uh, semiconductors. So why Taiwan or South Korea are not being uh, in this field? Uh, could you explain that? Yeah, no, it's a very good point. Um, and I would add there are one or two other important countries like Germany, for example, which mm -hmm. produces some of the really advanced chemicals that go into uh, semiconductor production um, is, is another country that's relevant here to this story. And so, and there are others. So, uh, so this is a, this is correct. You're right that there are more countries involved, not a large group of countries, but 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 more than just the three that we've talked about, U.S., Japan, and Netherlands, and in in principle, you would want um, all of those relevant countries to be involved in the same effort uh, to try to um, deny China these um, access to these really advanced semiconductors. I think the the basic answer to your question is that the 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 White House, the 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 Biden administration viewed. Uh, this certain type of semiconductor and the machinery to make it as particularly problematic. And in this case, it's the United States, Japan, and Netherlands, which really are central to this machinery, uh, high-end high, high, uh, high end, 
uh, advanced uh, machinery that were central. But yes, South Korea produces a lot of chips. By the way, they use some of this machinery in China to produce mm -hmm. uh, chips that are not, uh, semiconductors, not such advanced chips, but still quite advanced semiconductors and, and much lower value semiconductors. There are two South Korean companies that produce those things with this machinery in China. And so that, that uh, in theory, that, um, that is another a source of, of, uh, of, of access for China to these uh -huh. uh, semiconductors and machines. And so the US you know, has been talking to the Korean government about ways to control um, uh, those, um, those supplies. Uh, right. to China, and it's a little more complicated story, but but yes, there's a there's a sort of a broader, but a, you know, ultimately limited group of countries that are involved in this high end uh, semiconductor production that that should be part of the story, and that that the U.S. is definitely and Japan are talking to um, about that wider set of of concerns, um, and and they're using a kind of um, a fancy word, but plurilateral groupings that is a group not a not a wide group of countries but a handful of countries to get them together to try to um to try to control uh, these these sensitive technologies right so the supply chain is global um different countries producing a different part of the uh, entire production process and i think it is uh, important to have the sort of a collective effort to to uh, to achieve the same goal and to make sure that you know all the relevant players are in a sort of a same direction for controlling these items and uh, trying to um, to trying to achieve the same goal, which is to prevent and slow down uh, China to be build up a military uh, capabilities. And right. I think this is a uh, this is an important uh, element, and I think I am sure that the United States are in discussion with uh, uh, South Korea and and Taiwan to to that extent, and make sure that the you know uh, these issues, particularly the South Korean production in in China, would not uh, disrupt the objective of the uh, multilateral uh, objective or plurilateral but objective. But if I could add, this is where your first question about the definition of economic security uh, comes back, um, mm -hmm. because because each country that you just mentioned, um, I think, shares some level of concern uh, that the United States has about the potential national security risks of letting China get access to certain types of technology. Uh, they, I think, agree with some of that concern, but maybe not to the same extent the US does. I mean, they have a maybe less uh, immediate sort of sense of national security threat than the US does, and maybe more, um, more concern about maintaining a, um, a steady business and economic right. relationship with China. I mean, every country wants a good economic relationship with China, a robust economic relationship with China, but also, at least the allied and friendly countries we've been talking about, I think they all feel some sense of risk or even threat from China. So we're all trying to balance those interests. And the U.S. is maybe more heavily weighting the national security issues, but we're concerned about the economic engagement. Um, and, you know, Secretary of State Blinken was just in China talking about maybe you know, continuing to talk about economic cooperation, even when we're trying to restrict national security um, or address national security concerns. And China, uh, Japan is similarly balancing these things, maybe with a little more weight towards maintaining economic openness or engagement with China. But there's a national security concern in Japan, too. So it's a quite the, the hard thing about cooperation or the need for cooperation is to try to find some balance that works best for everyone in the right. um, friendly countries. But the difficulty is that we all have slightly different views of what that balance should be. So we have to work quite hard to try to get that balance right. Right. Um, that's exactly what we 
start to we we discuss it in the beginning that you know the nuances the balances you know how what is the best balance is you know i think the it, it's very subjective i mean how how do you see the challenges from china how do you see the threat um i think you know each country have a different responses and i think it's very subjective and uh, and, and of course it's uh, it's defined by geography so i think there is a a, a lot of uh, things that is uh, that that is difficult and i you know by nature the economic security is always the balance between the security and the economy so how do you you know uh, set the sort of common ground is an important uh, discussion and in that context, uh, let me ask you about the further bigger uh, plurilateral uh, framework called IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. And uh, IPEF has, um, has agreed on the supply chain agreement, and the Japan and the US are both in the IPEF. And there is uh, some uh, new concept of the crisis response network, which provides the emergency communication channel uh, for the IPF countries. And IPF, IPF country is 13, 14? Uh, 14. It's, it 14. includes 14, yes. 14 and includes the uh, 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 Southeast Asian countries, which are always in between the you know balances between the united states and china so how do you see this ipf framework for the supply chain uh, resilience or the um, you know emergency communication channels um, do you think that it is uh, possible that the ipf is the uh, uh, ipf plays a role to uh, to set up this um, sort of a, a supply chain resilience and uh, balancing this economy and the security? Yes, well, IPEF is um, a, the, the forum that the Biden administration had proposed as its main form of economic engagement in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, and so it's a very important initiative from the US perspective. Um, and Japan also thinks IPEF is important because it brings together those 14 countries, and frankly, especially because it brings the United States into some kind of regional discussion, which from Japan's point of view has been very important since the United States pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP, in 2017. There's been an absence, a lack of U.S. Um, engagement or, or presence in economic initiatives in the Indo-Pacific region. So Japan's very eager to have the United States in there. That's just sort of background to IPEF and why it's so important. Um, this supply chain uh, agreement that was reached last month is the first substantial agreement mm -hmm. under IPEF. It's one of the four pillars of work or um, kind of areas of, of work. Uh, supply chain resilience. And this is the first one where they've reached an agreement in principle among the 14 countries. All 14 countries signed this uh, initial agreement. And it does create a kind of crisis response mechanism. Um, in fact, it creates three mechanisms, and that's one of them. It also uh, tries to, another group is going to look at different sectors uh, where uh, there, should, there need to be action plans to ensure greater supply chain resilience. So sectors like pharmaceuticals or, um, or semiconductors or, or other areas potentially that could be disrupted in a crisis. As you say, there's this crisis response mechanism if there is a crisis and how countries can communicate quickly to ensure that supplies continue to flow of uh, essential items. And then there's a separate um, working group on labor uh, issues, which is a very important uh, concern for the United States. Um, the details of this agreement are not yet available to the public, so we don't know exactly what these different groups are going to talk about um, or how they're going to address the concerns, but, uh, but it's significant that the IPF countries reached an agreement in this area and I think it shows that there's a, a very broad 
concern, a widely shared concern in uh, these 14 countries, including, as you say, uh, many uh, Southeast Asian countries that, that don't necessarily want to choose the United States or China as their preferred economic partner. They sort of want both, and Japan they want to have as a partner. So they, they want to um, you know, have, have different arrangements, but they, these Southeast Asian countries agreed to this supply chain agreement. I think we have to see what the details are and how it's implemented in practice, frankly, and, and um, you know, I, as an outside observer of this, but somebody who has worked in the US government in the past, I do worry a little bit about the, um, about the durability of this agreement because it, it is an executive agreement. That means it's an agreement between governments, but it's not a, a negotiated um, agreement that, that our US Congress or the Japanese diet pass as law in our respective countries. And therefore, it only survives or continues as, as a, an agreement that um, affects these, these issues in supply chains if the governments continue to uh, enforce the agreements and and uh, monitor activity and continue to participate in these three groups and so forth. And frankly, in our system, but also in your system, governments change and these things come and go. And I'm a little concerned that that if this doesn't become law, it, it which makes it permanent, it, it will be hard to sustain these efforts. But I, I don't want to be too critical because I do think we don't know yet what the details of this agreement are, and, and it may be more useful and more durable than I think, but I'm a little bit worried about this. Right. Well, um, talking about the change of government, Japan experienced uh, less uh, op occasions of uh, change of government. So there is a, a further continuity in the case of the administrative agreement. But nevertheless, I, I agree that, you know, if you need to make it as a permanent concrete agreement, then it requires uh, to, to establish as a law and to make sure that it is, uh, it is continuous to, you know, uh, across the different administrations. Um, uh, we do have a, a little bit of time, but I think this is going to be a last uh, question uh, before we go into a Q&A. Please um, send us a Q&A as uh, as much as possible so that they will be able to cover uh, much wider um, issues. So my my last question from my question is, is that uh, um, the G7 summit has uh, has mentioned to a certain extent about the coercive dimension of the Chinese economic statecraft and uh, there are necessity to discuss and to uh, set up some sort of a um, coercion resilient or anti-coercion mechanism. Um, do you think that they, they, it will be taking place? I mean, in Europe, EU has proposed the idea of anti-coercion instruments. And I think these kind of things that if there is an intentional coercive measures taking place, then uh, we need to do something to respond to. And do you think that this will be done at the G7 level or much wider, you know, uh, uh, plurilateral framework? Do we need to have some sort of a platform? Uh, it, it, what kind of platform is it going to be? Um, so those are. Uh, so how do you see how how do you think about these, um, you know, uh, 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 react, retaliatory measures to the coercive measure, uh, coercive actions? Well, uh, another very good question. As you know, um, CSIS, my my program at CSIS published a report in March on this topic of, of China's economic coercion. And we, we looked at eight case studies over the last 13 years, starting with the Japan rare earths case in 2010, uh, up to the uh, current case with Lithuania, uh, which has offended Beijing by having a sign on a door which says Taiwan, Taiwan. Um, on it. 
And um, in each case, China has um, exerted some economic pressure on the country that that um, you know made it made Beijing unhappy. Um, and the pattern that we saw was China does this in a very informal way, at a fairly low level way, um, in an, in a way that doesn't have huge economic uh, cost for the country targeted. Um, it's it's difficult for the companies that are affected, but in a macroeconomic sense, doesn't necessarily have a huge impact. And that's partly because China doesn't want to absorb huge cost itself. If China imposes a heavy cost on Japan or Lithuania or other countries, then that kind of implies that it's also accepting a high cost itself of cutting off trade um, with that country, for example. Um, so China has been reluctant to impose that cost on itself. Um, so against that backdrop and that that those findings, we um, concluded that the best response for the United States, Japan, and other partners who are willing to move quickly is to do two things that are not retaliation. One is to uh, help make our trading partners uh, and potential targets of China's coercion to help make them more resilient, which means give them more trading options and make them less dependent on China's market, which, um, which makes them vulnerable to uh, Chinese pressure. So this resilience um, idea, which we've been talking about in this whole conversation, is central to, uh, to that part of the strategy, in our view, to fight coercion. And then the other is relief which is to provide relief or, or help to countries that are targeted by China in, in its coercion. And so that could be just a statement of support, uh, or it could be a WTO case, um, or it could be a money, potentially a small amount of money, uh, to help uh, uh, the, the targeted country or its companies deal with this uh, pressure. We think that those are the, the key elements of, of a response. The problem with retaliation is that, as I mentioned, China does this coercion at a fairly low level. So if we respond at the same low level, it probably will not change China's behavior. But if we escalate, we lose credibility because you're asking uh, the United States or Japanese citizens to pay a higher cost to support some other country's uh, exporters. And it's, there's probably a, a pretty low ceiling or a limit to how much we're going to be willing to escalate or raise that retaliation. So, And every country we talked to in our study, the, the countries that were targeted said, we don't want the United States to retaliate because it will just cause more problems for us vis-a-vis -vis China. So for those reasons, we emphasize more resilience and relief and less on retaliation, but governments, including, as you mentioned, the G7 countries have agreed and are looking at this issue and Europe has this anti-coercion instrument it's developing, which do include all of those things, resilience, relief, and retaliation. And you know, I understand why governments are trying to develop retaliatory tools. We just don't think that that is the central tool uh, to respond in this case. And one more thing, I think, honestly, I think much of the burden of this response is going to fall on the United States and Japan because we are the first and third largest economies in the world. We are very closely aligned as partners and allies, and we can move quickly. Um, mm -hmm. I, even the broader G7 group, I think it's going to be harder to get that group to move quickly in mm -hmm. the case of, of coercion. And when you get beyond the G7, I think it'll be even harder so I personally think, although I welcome the G7 statement, I would welcome other countries who are interested in joining that common effort. I think realistically, it's going to fall on the U.S. and Japan uh, to do most of the, the hard work here. Right. Um, so that means that the, um, the citizens of U.S. And, uh, and Japan may face a, a much, well, to, to certain responsibility to... Uh, to respond to these, um, uh, you know, collective measures, um, sure. but ne nevertheless, I, th I I think it is a uh, well, it is different from the sort of a collective defense like NATO or you know the U.S. Japan military alliance, but it is the economy is much more 
complex because it involves not just the military, but also involves a lot of companies and the citizens. Um, so it, it, you know, it's, it's not like we, we can't really use the sort of similar an analogy of the military collective alliance, but uh, it's, uh, uh, although it is a security issue, I mean, the economic security is part of the security issue, but still, you know, uh, it requires a certain different uh, ways to think uh, of that, uh, um, uh, to ways to think about, um, you know, how to, uh, how to respond and how to um, set up the international order. So I uh, receive a, a couple of very interesting questions. So I can't, I, given the limited time, I, I can't really go everything, but uh, um, just pick up a couple interesting questions. So first question is that it is widely known that uh, US government has been initially developing new regulations for outbound investment for the US, uh, from the US. Uh, what are the major reasons, if any, that uh, we need outbound investment screening systems when we have export control in terms of preventing the outflow of sensitive technologies to countries of concerns? Yes, this is a, another very important question. There is a, a, a serious um, review going on in the US government and I think in other capitals as well and other governments of creating this sort of outbound investment mechanism, which would basically more or less restrict um, investment, meaning uh, financial uh, flows into, frankly, China, Russia, maybe potentially added as another country of concern, but it's right now in Washington, the focus is mostly on China. If, if an American company or an investor um, invests, puts a, a in production in China um, of certain sensitive technologies, um, or maybe provides financial support for such production in China, then that could be another source of concern that is not covered by export controls. Export controls are, are aimed at a production in the United States or other countries outside China that sell into China through exporting to China. And so those controls are designed to, to uh, protect or to limit uh, those exports of sensitive technologies. This is a separate related problem, but of, of production in China of sensitive technologies uh, that, that the US and other countries are looking at possibly controlling um, the support or the financial investment in those uh, that production capabilities in certain areas. Mm -hmm. This is a very controversial discussion in Washington. It's been going on for actually, in some ways, it's been going on for five years mm -hmm. because it was discussed by Congress when they passed the new investment inbound investment screening mechanism, the so-called CFIUS reforms five years ago. Uh, but it was not approved by Congress and it's been discussed ever since, but especially in the last nine months, or so, there's been a very active discussion. And the White House says many times publicly that there will be an outbound investment screening mechanism, but it has not appeared yet. And that shows that there is quite an, um, a, a very active debate within the government about how to do this in a way that is reasonable and that is targeted at just the problem we're concerned about and doesn't restrict legitimate flows of investment and financial flows into China for harmless purposes. It, they're trying to figure out a mechanism for controlling it just for these sensitive technologies without causing broader disruption. And that turns out to be quite a difficult debate. Um, and, and so it, you know, we're all waiting to see uh, what's gonna come. It will come, there will be an announcement of something uh, of an executive order in this area uh, but I've been saying that for the last nine months and it hasn't happened yet. So I don't know when it's going to happen, but it will happen. Right. Uh, 
Um, so it's interesting that um, the outbound investment uh, screening is also discussed in the EU context, but not uh, not in Japan. So I think, you know, given the complex issues, and I think it is also very much of the resistance from the investors, uh, it is uh, it is again a very difficult uh, balance between the security and the businesses. And exactly. I think this, yeah, this is uh, uh, something that uh, we, we can't really see the, the sort of an optimum solution, but I think it requires a certain political will to do this and that uh, in order to uh, to achieve its political goal. And I think, um, uh, as you said, I, I, uh, it will be coming in, uh, in some time soon, but uh, we don't know when. So the next question I'd like to ask you is that uh, India, so this is another interesting uh, subject, and we haven't uh, discussed that, but uh, India is an important country. So India, the question is, India is becoming more influential in Asia-Pacific region in various fields. How, do you, uh, how far do you believe India will play a vital role from a standpoint of uh, supply chain resilience? Uh, what are the shared value and disagreement between uh, the United States and the Indian government. Good, and I see there's a separate but related question from another person about the Quad uh, yeah. um, agreement, which is the US, Japan, Australia, and India. And similarly, what is the role of the Quad in strengthening economic security? So I see these as sort of interrelated questions, good questions. Um, uh, so uh, the, the Prime Minister of India, Mr. Modi, was in Washington uh, last week for a state visit, a very high level visit. And uh, there were many topics discussed between Prime Minister Modi and President Biden. Uh, but in the report, the readout, that is the, the fact sheet or the, the um, statement from the White House about the, the substantive discussions in the, between the US and Indian leaders, uh, the very first item, on the fact sheet that I have open on my other screen here says strengthening semiconductor supply chains. Um, and then there's another section on critical mineral partnerships and other technology cooperation. So it's clear that the White House and I think the Indian government see cooperation between the US and India in this area of technology um, uh, uh, development, but also technology protection is a central part of the bilateral US-India relationship today. India, as you know, is now, I think, the fifth largest economy in the world. It now has the largest number of people in the world, more than China. Um, it is a country of the future that is, going, that is growing faster than any other country in the Indo-Pacific region um, and has great technological capabilities, as well as, by the way, capabilities in other important uh, sectors that are part of the supply chain story, like wow. pharmaceuticals, um, but which is also talked about in the U.S.-India statement. But so I think from Washington's perspective, India is a key partner, and we are trying to find ways to work with India in these areas, supply chain resilience um, and technology control, as well as technology development. Um, and it's really a new level of, of cooperation that I, I've been in a, working on India-related issues for 20 or 30 years, and I've always felt that the economic and sort of technology part of our relationship has been uh, very limited or very difficult because India has not been interested in engaging this statement and the results of that summit make clear that now things have changed. And I think both Washington and New Delhi see huge opportunity and huge need for cooperation uh, between the two countries in these important areas. And that is also reflected in the quad, this, these four countries that uh, got together first almost 20 years ago after the uh, South um, Indian Ocean a tsunami disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, they got together because these four countries all have great uh, naval uh, uh, rescue capabilities, but that relationship has now evolved into a broader security relationship 
and now has added these elements of economic and technology cooperation uh, that I think are quite significant and you know difficult because we these are very different countries in many ways. Uh, we're all dem democracies and we all share some interests, but we have different um, different capabilities, different um, perspectives, different uh, specific interests. And so I think, um, and frankly, different sort of political cultures. So it's, I think, going to be quite difficult to get firm agreements on some of these issues in the Quad. But I do think they are important topics on the agenda for the Quad. And I certainly, I think many other experts like you and me are watching those developments very closely to see if something tangible comes out of that. Right. Well, thank you very much. I, I, I think uh, I, I was in discussion with uh, people from uh, uh, from India uh, yesterday, and uh, it is in interesting that even though there is uh, differences of the values and uh, you know political systems, but still there is uh, merits in uh, supply chain resilience and uh, you know working together. And I think the Quad framework, as well as the you know the bilateral uh, cooperation um for the supply chain resilience it uh, it benefits both so i think uh, there is uh, a lot of uh, opportunities for uh japan us and india to work together so unfortunately the time has come to the end and uh, uh i thank uh, matthew uh, for a great discussion and also, uh, I thank uh, all the participants and the listeners of this webinar uh, to uh, to join and uh, given us uh, great uh, great questions. So, uh, with that, I would like to conclude and uh, uh, give it back to uh, Josh. Thank you so much, Professor Suzuki. Uh, apologies to our audience members that we weren't able to get to all of your questions, but I think that is a sign of how uh, important and robust this conversation is, uh, that there were so uh, many questions. Um, so I would like to thank uh, our wonderful speaker today, uh, Mr. Matthew P. Goodman, uh, for joining us today and sharing your expertise and your knowledge with us. Really uh, appreciate it. Um, thank you. Would, no, no problem. Um, and then I would also like to thank Professor Suzuki for your wonderful moderation of today's program. Uh, also would like to give thanks to our simultaneous interpreters and technicians at NHK and our captioners. Lastly, I would like to invite all of our audience members to visit our website uh, and our social media accounts for further information about upcoming events and programs. And we hope to see you again uh, at one of those either virtually or in person. Uh, thanks everyone, really appreciate your you're giving us your time today.